Back in 1996 or so, I gave at a symposium in Chicago a paper titled Continuations of Chan Ink Painting into Ming Ching and the Prevalence of Type Images. It aroused quite a stir with my colleagues who were there at the time, and they hailed it as a major contribution that would change everybody's way of thinking about later Chinese painting and uh, about publishing it. And they were all asking about publishing this important paper. It was eventually published in the Archives of Asian Art, number 50, for 1997 to 98, pages 17 to 41. And so far as I'm aware, it's been scarcely noticed since then. At least I haven't seen citations of it or heard responses to it. I mean to make it into a video lecture then and post it with the others so that it will be more easily accessible. But that will be later. For now, I want to present a similar argument, this time in the form of a video lecture since I'm no longer writing learned articles for journal publication. And uh, this time I'll give it a title that in full would read something like Continuations of Song Professional Slash Academy Landscape Painting into Later Times and the Blessings of Chant Survivals. But that's a title that no good editor would accept. And I'll shorten it to make it fit into our GIP series. As for what has occasioned this lecture, which isn't one of those originally planned for this series, I'll reveal that later on. A large general observation behind my earlier paper was that Chinese painting as we know it, it is only a tiny fraction of what was actually produced over the centuries. By far the most of it has been lost, destroyed, not preserved by the care and remounting that are needed for centuries-long survival. And those factors in turn depend heavily on what kinds of paintings were valued, what kinds were considered by collectors and dealers to be worth preserving. I've bewailed in my writings the historical fact that Chinese connoisseurs and collectors went for big names, signatures of famous masters, or at least attributions to them. So that the attribution of a painting to some old master, even when the attribution made no sense, worked for its survival. And I've, writ I've written repeatedly about how blessed we are that large numbers of Chinese paintings were taken to Japan from early times and kept there, and that they included kinds not preserved in China, what we call Chan or Zen painting, for instance. Uh, it's a notable example. It was produced in China, of course, by Chinese artists, and continued to be produced into Ming and Qing times, mostly in Chan monasteries, I think. But it wasn't preserved in China because it didn't belong among the kinds of literati connoisseurs and collectors there considered worth collecting. Uh, this is another big item in my all-over indictment of the Chinese literati for what they've done uh, in terribly narrowing and impoverishing our view of Chinese culture, an indictment that has been a big theme in much of my later writing and lecturing. Now I want to show a series of Sung paintings and sections and details from them, nearly all things that we've seen before, to make some general comments about the great tradition of Sung landscape as practiced by the real artists, the professional or vocational masters who made up the main tradition, with some of the best of them working in the Imperial Academy, artists whose works we know through their preservation in both China and Japan. And after that, I'll show images of paintings that I take to be post-Sung works, uh, that is, uh, Yuan early Ming works, that continue somehow the great tradition. I'll begin with the great master who is, for me, the central figure in Southern Sung uh, landscape tradition. He is, of course, Xia Gui. First slide, please. This image will, I hope, be very familiar, or even over-familiar, to everyone who watched our first series, A Pure and Remote View. It's the central section of Xia Gui's Great Hand Scroll, A Pure and Remote View of Streams and Mountains, Qi Shan Qing Yuan Tu, Zhu Zhuan in Chinese. Xia Gui's contribution to this landscape painting tradition include new, highly effective ways of rendering solid forms in space, with special effects such as sudden leaps from foreground into depth. He systematizes the device of 
placing in deep space the hills or mountaintops that stretch into far distance. By using some shaping and texturing strokes on the closer ones, less of them on the ones further back, and none at all on the furthest, which are shown as pale silhouettes. Next. Among the ways Xiaogui creates space is by placing two groups or groves of leafy trees in a diagonal separation, with the further one lighter and more simply drawn, and then positioning other images, uh, buildings, figures, and so on, in between them. This formation is not entirely new with Xiaogui, but he employs it to great effect and with a special sense of naturalness. Next. This painting in the old Freer collection, which is said to have had a Xiaogui signature before it was lost in remounting, uh, exhibits powerfully his device of placing a large, strongly textured mass in one lower corner and opening space behind and above it. And it exemplifies again his way of creating depth and distance with forms that become less textured and paler in ink tone as they recede. Next. We can observe something like it in this landscape album leaf in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, a favorite of mine that I would like to credit to Xia Gui, although it has no signature and no attribution. And it offers another landscape featuring the dark, strongly silhouetted tree groups, the, the lighter middle ground, and the crest of a hill, lightly textured and seen above an area of fog or mist. All these are employed with such ease and effect that we're scarcely conscious of them. And the narrative theme, the scholar nearing the shore in his boat and the path leading into the misty forest that he will follow, an image that draws our gaze into misty depths. These don't stand out, but are completely integrated into the whole. Next. If we look at an actual photograph of a passage of landscape as seen from a distance, here it's the West Lake near Hangzhou, viewed from a hilltop, the naturalistic bases for these painting conventions are caught by the camera just as the eye of the artist perceives them in nature and recreates them in his paintings. In saying that, of course, I am reflecting a terribly old-fashioned, even outmoded way of looking at paintings and evaluating paintings. We have been endlessly admonished by the literati or the scholar amateur advocates that we aren't supposed to look at the scenery, we look at the brushwork the hand of the artist and the gestural strength of the brushstroke. And nothing could be more discredited today than admiring the skills of painters who capture natural appearances with some effect of fidelity in their paintings. In this ending section of Li Sung's hand scroll of the West Lake near Hangzhou, the same visual transition into depth is caught with striking visual truthfulness of a kind that wouldn't be paralleled in Western painting until the rise of Impressionism in the 19th century. Many of you will be familiar with this, this juxtaposition of photo and painting since I used it to make the same point in the first of my compelling image lectures in the 1970s and in the opening chapter of the 1982 book in which they were published. Next. Another photo, this one of Huangshan Mountains and Pines, shows again the passage into depth from the strongly textured to the dimmer and less textured to the far distant peaks in silhouette, a visual experience that we're all familiar with from our own viewings of the world around us, and which the Chinese professional artists recreate in their landscape paintings. Continuing with my argument, even though most of us now succumb to the admonition against valuing good representation in painting, it's still true, as I've pointed out many times, that an exhibition of any one of those artists who did it supremely well, Velasquez, Vermeer, Rembrandt, Degas, others, you name them, uh, such an exhibition will draw in far more visitors and hold their attention much longer than any made up of works by one of the conceptual people, the look at my clever idea people. Anyone who argues otherwise is, I think, guilty of some degree of hypocrisy. Next, we can look back at some familiar Sung period landscape paintings to review the conventions they use. This opening section of the great landscape hand scroll ascribed to Xu Daoning uses the device of placing a strong foreground cluster of trees and a building, a roof with a flag, in the lower corner and then drawing the eye back from it into far depth over a stretch of water 
with a shoreline and more distant houses along the way. Next. In this ending of the Freer Hen Scroll, attributed to Guashi, the foreground cluster consists of crossed pine trees and a tingza, or rest shelter, barely seen, along with a large rock or earth mass, from which the river valley stretches away diagonally, with hilltops and rises of land strongly modeled and silhouetted, marking stages along the way up to a high horizon. Next. The great Dream Journey on the Shaoxiang Hand Scroll by the otherwise unknown Mr. Li working in Anhui. The movements from near to far in this hand scroll are not accomplished with such strong shifts in ink tonality or textural detail, since the whole painting is a vision seen from a distance, not one that we're invited to enter in imagination. This is another painting, an unknown professional master, that testifies heartbreakingly, I think, to the terrible losses that we've suffered through the failure of Chinese connoisseurs to appreciate and preserve such paintings. This one survived, as you remember, only because it was fitted with a spurious inscription signed by Li Gunglin, who couldn't possibly have painted such a work. It was far beyond his comp competence. And so this great painting, unique among surviving landscape paintings, was admired and passed down through the orthodox lineage. Dong Chi Chong through the Qianlong Emperor, because it was falsely claimed as a work by one of the literati amateurs. Ha oh, this is a sad commentary, I think, on how we have been collectively buffaloed by this stifling orthodoxy and how much of a loss that we've suffered from it. Next, paintings in the Southern Qing Academy style, such as this anonymous fan painting that must date to around the late 12th century, offer their own form of the system of drawing the, the viewer's gaze back from a strongly rendered foreground, here sur uh, surmounted by a vertical cliff face, to a distance with a village seen dimly on the shore. The echoing of the three protrude protruding tops of pine trees near to far aids in this visual move, and a boat with a fisherman on it help to mark the receding water surface. All of these are common properties of these masters, who worked collectively, even while a few of them exhibited distinctive styles. Not the brushworky, look at me, self-promotion of the scholar amateurs, but a quieter demonstration of a shared heritage passed from one to the other through studio training from an early age. Next. Distinctive individual styles can of course be marked within this shared heritage. Ma Yuan and Xia Gui are notable cases but they share in the common values, only adding to them, not discarding them in pursuit of some more striking individuality. Ma Yuan signed fan painting in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, a famous composition with willows, presents no such leap into far depth, only an easy passage across a bridge from the foreground with willows and the returning farmer to the dimly seen houses on the shore that are his destination. Next. The landscapes from the end of Sung that we call Chan landscapes, or Zen landscapes, best exemplified by the Xiaoxiang series of views, one series ascribed to Mu Qi, and the other by Yu Jian, represent a softening and distancing of the academy landscape manner that they inherit from Xia Gui and others, a stronger sense that the scenery is being viewed through an atmospheric ha haze. They mostly place the same dark foreground in one corner, and then carry us back across wide stretches of water to further shores with trees and sometimes buildings. These make up the best evidence for where the great tradition of ink monochrome landscape was going in the late Qing period, the best we have. And again, we have them only because they were preserved in Japan. Next. A few isolated survivals from other continuations of Southern Qing Academy styles past the end of Song can be found in odd places, mostly in Japan, where they were prized and preserved in ways that they didn't enjoy in China. Notable among these survivals is the pair of paintings in the Koto Inn in Kyoto, which once were side pieces to a Buddhist figure painting ascribed preposterously to Wu Daozi in a triptych, and they went from this to being hailed as works by Li Tang after Shimada found a partly erased signature on one of them but which are really, I've always said, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, 
uh, are really end of song or slightly later works by some Xiaogui follower outside the academy. Next. Less known, but closely related to the Kotuin landscapes, is this small painting of a mountain valley after a heavy rainfall, with a figure not unlike the one in one of the Kotuin pictures, holding a broad rain hat onto his head, wading through the flooded area at the base of a cliff down which the waterfall drops. This further space of the picture is seen through tall bamboo growing on dark earth banks, and a foreground into which the water pours. A remarkable little picture, which used to be my own. It may still be in our Berkeley Art Museum, and it deserves more attention. Next. Another clue to the continuation of the Xiaogui manner of, uh, manner of painting into post-Sung times is the horizontal landscape painting seen here, representing travelers in early winter, attributed to a Yuan period Xiaogui follower named Zhang Yuan, an attribution that makes good sense. In style, it seems to represent the aftermath of a stage represented by the Koto and landscapes. The painting, which has been kept in the Shokokuji, a Buddhist temple in Kyoto, from around the 14th century, or maybe earlier, has been called Korean by Japanese scholars, but that attribution has no foundation at all. It used to be common to dismiss problematic landscape paintings that you couldn't, you couldn't manage otherwise, to dismiss them as Korean as a way of disposing of them. And no Korean painting in a comparable style has ever been produced to bolster this attribution. I published it in my Hills Beyond a River book as quite possibly by Zhang Yuan, the person to whom it's attributed. And in any case, it's a post sung work in the tradition of Li Tong and Xia Gui. Its similarities, both to the Koto and pair and to the small rainy landscape that I just showed, are obvious. Together, these paintings can be taken to indicate, I think, the direction that this great tradition of landscape painting took after its strongest period was over. Next. For the continuation of the Ma Yuan Manor, the works of the Yuan period artist Sun Jun Se offer the best visual evidence. Several works with his signatures, or seals, are in Japanese collections. This pair of signed landscapes by him is kept in the Seikado, a private museum in Tokyo that houses a very old family collection, the Iwasaki collection. A number of other paintings by Sun Jun Se are in other collections in Japan. His works are unknown in China because Chinese collectors felt no desire to own works by this minor master in a discredited landscape manner. To own one would be to exhibit one, one's low taste. Next, this large sign painting by Sun Jun Se, which is now well known and preserved in our Berkeley Art Museum, was transmitted through the centuries in China, but not under the name of its real author. The Sun Jun Se signature in the lower left, which matches closely the ones on his works in Japan, was partly obliterated with a stroke of ink, and the painting was preserved as a, an anonymous Sung period work, with a label attached to it reading, certainly painted by Ma Yuan. Ha ha! Chinese collectors, that is, prefer to fake Ma Yuan to a genuine Sun Jun Se. It's one of the paintings that I gave to my daughter Sarah, and it's now one of her favorites. Now, what becomes of these traditions when we move into the Ming Dynasty? Next, please. Here is one section of a Ming copy of the Great Xia Gui Scroll. The evidence for a continuation of the landscape styles of Xia Gui and others of the Southern Sung Professional Academy tradi uh, tradition is sparse, mostly because the paintings that might represent it haven't been preserved, as I say, in any number in China. We do have a few Ming copies after the famous Xia Gui Scroll. The composition, at least, seems to have continued to be well known and often copied. Even the famous Long Scroll of Seshu, Chou Kan, is in some part a distant echo of that famous Xia Gui work, as we'll see in my Seshu lecture. I reproduced this section of one early Ming copy, I think it's in the old Metropolitan Museum collection, as giving us some sense of what the missing opening sections of the original Xia Gui scroll must have looked like, an opening that's, an opening that's now lost. And it presents us with some of the same features, a powerful foreground mass, 
a rock surmounted by trees as a starting point, and more groves of trees, <coughs> and more groves of trees, repeating in shape but diminishing in size and ink tonality, arranged in a diagonal succession, taking us into the depths of the picture, and a far shore that is seen only dimly, with a pale hilltop above it, and small anecdotal images such as houses and boats of fishermen along the shore and on the water. Next. We do have a few signed Ming paintings by known artists, such as Dai Jin, that more or less follow the Shagwei tradition, notably this one by him in the Shanghai Museum, but works in this softer manner with space and depth were mostly scorned and not preserved. This one, for instance, bears an inscription by Dung Chi Chang that can be read as more put down than praise. Quote, all the professional artists of our dynasty, Dung Chi Chang writes, think that Dai Jin is a great master, end quote. Something like that, implying that, but we cultivated literati know better. Next. The large Dai Jin painting that I myself discovered and owned for a while, before selling it cheap to the Berkeley Art Museum, has a similar com uh, composition but performs it on a larger scale and on silk. This is the kind of painting that was intended for hanging in a great hall of some rich man's residence. The lower part with a house among leafy trees preserves some of the old Sung models, as does the similar passage in the Shanghai Museum picture that we just saw. And the temple in the ravine in upper left, of course, follows northern Sung practice. A painting by Daijin of this title, Summer Trees Casting Shade, is recorded as having been in the collection of the wicked Prime Minister Yen Sung, uh, whose uh, holdings were confiscated and cataloged after his downfall in the late 16th century. And this may well have been the very painting. Next. But most of Dai Jin's surviving paintings follow the more popular Ming practice, especially within the so-called Zhou School, of which he was the leading figure, of building the picture out of boldly delineated masses of more or less equal weight, reducing depth, enhancing the decorative power of the compositions, the subtleties and the tonal nuances of Xia Gui and the Southern Song Ink monochrome tradition have pretty much disappeared in paintings of this kind. Next, a few late Ming artists, notably Zhang Hung around the end of Ming, sometimes did landscapes in the Xia Gui style, testifying that the style was still known and admired by some. This is the Xia Gui Leaf in Zhang Hong's album of landscapes and old styles, which I showed, I think, in the third lecture in this series. And even Dong Chi Chang, as I said when I talked about Xia Gui in the lecture on him, had good words for, for Xia Gui, while having nothing positive to say about the other artists of the Southern Shu Academy. The nuances of Xia Gui's paintings, that is, their near magical ha handling of space and solid form, got through even to Dung Chi Chang. Next. But later artists who attempt to recreate the styles and the landscape types of the late Song mostly do it in such a heavy-handed way that all subtlety is lost, and their paintings lie as heavy brushstrokes on the surface. I can't remember who painted this picture or why I copied it, but it can serve to exemplify this falling off. Much of the old pictorial elements remain the repeated tree groves, the stretches of water with boats, the high horizon with hills, but all nuances of brushwork and ink, ink tone are gone. Next. But what about Seshu? This great Japanese master spent two years in China from 1467, and by his own testimony, he met lots of Chinese artists there, besides seeing what he took to be genuine works by the major Southern Song Academy masters, such as Li Tang and Ma Yuan and Xia Gui, as well as Yu Jin, the Chan master. And he does copies and imitations of these masters, labeling them with their names, that do indeed reveal a good understanding of their styles. Sesshu also learned the styles of the Zhou school masters and others of the Ming, and he can imitate them with considerable skill. Most interestingly, in an album of 22 signed landscapes, an album that for mysterious reasons had been ignored by the Japanese scholars, even though its whereabouts is known and there's no reason to question its authenticity, in this album, Seshu recreates the Southern Sung styles in ways that not only reveal a 
familiarity with the original works of that period, but also, I believe, gives us important visual clues to how those styles were being carried on in Sestu's time, in, Ming, mid, in mid Ming China, that is. But there are matter, these are matters that I mean to talk about at length in a lecture on Sestu that centers on this remarkable album, in which I'll show and discuss all its leaves, so I won't say more about it now. Next. Now we come to the climaxes of this lecture, to which everything up to now has been leading up. Um, two paintings that I take to be post sung and maybe Yuan in date, both horizontal paintings. The second has been mounted in a frame under glass, uh, but I'm pretty sure it was originally mounted as a hand scroll. Both of them preserving lots of important features of the great Sung professional, professional slash academic traditions that I've been talking about. And both of them have been seriously misunderstood. The first, vastly overvalued, ascribed to a great early master. The second, undervalued, I think, so that it was offered at a European auction as a minor work of the 18th, 19th century and estimated at only a few hundred euros. I myself bid far more than that for it, but still only a fraction of what I think it's worth, and my bid won the painting. I know it so far only in images that the auction house sent me when I expressed interest in it. It's being shipped to our Berkeley Art Museum next week, and I'll see it there in the original for the first time and see whether it's really as early and important as I took it to be. So I've been able to build genuine suspense <laughs> within my own lecture by writing and, and uh, recording all this before I've seen the painting and finishing it sometimes after I've seen it and can report what I see. Next. The first of these two horizontal paintings is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It was acquired for the MFA in 1912 from the Manchu collector Wanyan Jingxian. It bears a colophone by another famous Manchu collector who was a high official, uh, the Viceroy Duanfang. Tom Lawton has written about both of them. It was acquired as a work by the famous 10th century master Dung Yuan and it bears a title and a colophone by none other than Dung Chi Chang, attributing the work to him, to this early master. But this is another case, like the Xiao Shang scroll by the unknown Mr. Li of Anhui, which survived because it was wrongly believed by Dung Chi Chang and others to be by Li Gung Lin. A wrong attribution, a ridiculous attribution, has saved for us a painting that would otherwise not have been preserved. The work from its style must be end of song at the earliest in date. The MFA now catalogs it as the work of the Jin Dynasty, the northern contemporaries of the southern song. And that's possible, although Yuan dating is also possible. In any case, it's a work that continues the great landscape traditions that I've been describing with lots of details of human habitation and uh, travel embedded in a picture that at first glance appears to be only about hills and water and groves of leafy trees. Next. Here is the first section. As we come in closer, we see that in the misty space between the second and third from the right of the ridges that dominate the composition, there is a temple, a complex of buildings with the gate closest and then the main building further back, and beyond that, taller and dimmer, another temple building. And below, occupying the space between groves of leafy trees, diagonally separated with a further grove smaller, is the rustic house of someone whom we can suppose is a retired scholar, uh, living quietly with his servants. In this detail, color detail, he can be seen approaching the gate in the wall, coming back from an outing, no doubt, bent over and with a cane showing his age, his servant following him carrying his chin or zither, a familiar complex representing the ideal of living in seclusion. Tom Wu, uh, writing about this painting when he was a curator at the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, points out that inside the house, seen through the open doorway, is a kong or heated couch that will warm the old man from his winter cold. Uh, next. In the section that follows, the hills slope downward as we near the end of the promontory or spit of land. A road emerges, as we see in another color detail here. 
a road emerges from behind one of the groves of trees at the bottom and winds upward with a traveler on a mule or a donkey, followed by two servants carrying his luggage. Again, familiar elements in traditional landscapes of this kind. Above this, the road reappears and then vanishes in the midst of a U-shaped dip in the land. It can be understood to continue leftward behind the smaller hill and out to the end of the promontory, as we'll see in the next section. Next, Moving closer in, we notice that a boat is moored at the shore just beside the road at the bottom. And we see also that the sky is darkened, a feature of these landscapes that I've pointed out, for instance, in the Great Hand Scroll by Xiao Gui, indicating lateness in the day, the travelers nearing their destination and their evening rest, as well as, in this case, a wintry sky. Next, the end of the scroll. As the large spit of land that dominated the first part diminishes to a low projection, we see at its very tip another traveler, astride his donkey and wearing his broad hat, waiting for the ferry, with his two servants, one with the luggage, the other out at the water's edge, signaling to the ferryman. Across the water, near the far shore, is a fisherman in his boat. We move back visually over this low projection of land, covered with vegetation rendered only as clusters of dots, to the hills, and these too take us back from one lightly shaped and dotted, a further one still lighter, and with less dotting, still further ones in pale silhouette. This handling of hills on the horizon can be seen with minor variations in one after another of these landscape hand scrolls by the traditional academic masters. It's part of the rich repertory of forms and images that are used with endless ingenuity by these masters. Uh, collective thematics, one might say, of these paintings. And it's part of what led to their being terribly undervalued and ignored by the traditional collectors and connoisseurs who insisted on greater individual inventiveness and more distinctive brushwork. Next. At the very end, on the promontory coming in from the left, is a cluster of thatched buildings with protrud a protruding flag that's the presumed destination of the travelers seen earlier, that is to say an inn where they can rest or stop for the night. And offshore we see the ferry boat that has just left this shore, the ferryman at the back sculling the boat, three passengers all leaning forward. They and the travelers seen earlier represent passage through the landscape by upper class men, as distinguished from the ferrymen and the fishermen who represent the lower class denizens of the place, those who live there. This distinction, which can be observed taking various forms in a great many old landscapes of this type, is another part of the large complex of images and conventions that make it up. Next, I'm not going to talk about the colophones in detail because they are misleading and tell us nothing that is really true and revealing about the painting. And yet, for the text readers who represent the great majority among scholars of Chinese painting, these are what really matter, the things that they must spend their time translating and interpreting in order to better understand the painting, or so they believe, <laughs> and I obviously don't. Uh, the first colophone is by Dung Chi Chang, and for many viewers it will overshadow the painting in importance. For me, it's welcome only because it's mainly responsible for the preservation of the painting. As I keep on saying, it was preserved only because this great connoisseur decided, quite mistakenly, that it must be a genuine work of a famous master, Zhong Yuan. Ha ha. My old friend Zhang Da Chen knew this bias of Chinese collectors very well when he added a Zhong Yuan signature to one of his forgeries, the one titled Riverbank. But that's another subject which I deal with at great length elsewhere. Next. Among the colophones that follow is one by Dung Xu Chang's disciple, Wang Shermin, the oldest of the four Wangs, who are the central figures in the orthodox school of landscape. Wang Shermin writes about how difficult it is to find genuine paintings by great masters such as this. He has nothing at all to say about the painting that reveals any close looking at it, any more than Dung Xu Chang's colophone has. Next. Finally, for this painting, the last colophone is by the Manchu collector Duanfang, 
who must have been shown it by still another Manchu collector of the time, Wan Yan Jingxian, the one who sold the scroll to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. These colophones add greatly to the scroll's value for any traditional Chinese viewer, as I say. But for me, they represent only the welcome misreading of the painting that led to its preservation. And I'll turn now to the last painting to be considered in this lecture, the one that I've just acquired at auction. Next. It's a horizontal painting, 45 centimeters in height, about 100 centimeters in length, painted in ink and white colors on paper. This is the left two-thirds of it. It's been mounted flat under glass in a frame for a long time, but it must originally have been a short hand scroll. It was bought in China by the German consul who was there from 1896 to 1929. So it left China in that great period for foreign collectors early in the 20th century when so much fine painting was turning up in Chinese collections and being sold abroad. I'm showing it in the reverse of the proper way, looking at the left side first, because that's where the foreground passage is, from which one moves off uh, across the water to the further shore. It's a quiet looking painting, scarcely impressive, but once one begins looking at it in detail, a lot more is going on in it than one thinks at first. Next. In the upper right corner is a ravine above the tall hill, and here we see a temple. The buildings that line the approach to the temple, then the gate, and then the main temple building, drawn in light line and seen dimly, but definitely there. So already we're confronted by the old convention of locating a temple far up above the level of ordinary human dwelling, reachable by climbing, and representing, of course, the spiritual or religious level of the human, of the human world. Next. We saw this in many of the landscape paintings that we looked at, including the Boston Museum of Art's Dungyuan that we just saw but even more in the monumental landscapes of the Five Dynasties and Northern Song periods. This is the one ascribed to Guangdong. In these early pictures, the path or roadway up to the temple is usually shown. In this new painting, there is no such indication of how one gets there, but the temple is nonetheless visually present. Next, returning to the lower part, the foreground of the picture, we see the two figures seated in the Tingzi, or rest shelter. They are wood gatherers. Chinese Jiao, uh, who roam the mountains gathering branches and twigs, which they bundle up and carry down to burn for charcoal or to sell for others to burn. Along with fishermen, they represent the ideal life as imagined by Chinese scholar officials and city dwellers, because they spend their time out in nature, gathering the bounties of nature, the wood from the forest, the fish from the river, without having to till the ground and plant and harvest as farmers have to do. I've compared them in my writings to the myth of the pastoral in Europe, courtiers and city people dreaming of being out there herding sheep on the hills. The wood gatherers and fishermen, moreover, are imagined in China to have been deep quasi-philosophical thinkers as they go about their work. We sometimes see paintings of them talking with each other, I can't find one of those to show you, so instead I put on this album leaf of a scholar gentleman conversing with a fisherman. Uh, in our painting, one of them is holding forth, clasping one leg with the other curled under him, and the other one leans forward listening. Both of them have set down their bundles of faggots. This foreground passage establishes the painting's traditional thematics for any Chinese viewer familiar with this tradition. I could show quite a few images of wood gatherers, Zhao. Best known among them, perhaps, is this album leaf by Ma Yuan, showing one of them coming down from the mountains with his loaded donkey on a cold winter day. Then, returning to the broader view in our painting, we see, not far from the shore, a boat with fishermen, one poling the boat, the other two, the other two hunched forward, holding nets, preparing to cast them and we realize that we do have the traditional juxtaposition of Jiao and Yu, wood gatherer and fisherman, in a different than usual form. My colleague Cyril Birch, who came by just as I was working on this lecture, reminds me that at the end of the play, Tao Hua Shan, which he translated, the peach blossom fan, there are these lines, when he gave them to me from memory, fisherman and woodcutter chatting of the past 
each of them recalling joys that did not last. When we turn our attention away from these human interest parts of the picture, we notice how the grove of leafy and bare trees that rises above the Tingza is more or less repeated further back to the right, carrying the eye into distance. And we notice low houses on the far shore, but I'll wait and approach them from the other side, the next. Here is the proper opening of the scroll, the right two-thirds, and now we see on the water not only the boat with fishermen, but some distance from it, another boat, this one a houseboat, with a boatman in the back and a traveler seen through the window of the enclosed section. Here is another juxtaposition of motifs familiar from old landscape paintings, especially hand scrolls, showing and contrasting the lower class people who live in the landscape, pursuing their livelihoods, and the upper class people who travel through it, away from home and on their way to official posts or commercial destinations. We noted this in the Boston scroll that we saw just a bit ago, and here it is again. Next. We see these contrasting types, for instance, in two sections of the Fisherman on the River hand scroll by Zhao Gan of the 10th century. This passage early in the scroll sets the comfortably dressed travelers on donkeys in the foreground against the shivering fishermen in their hut across the river. And this one near the end of the scroll shows two fishermen huddled in their huts on poles, again shivering with the cold, and further back a boat carrying an upper class person with brighter colored, no doubt warm clothing, making his way along the river. Next. Similarly, in the great hand scroll in the Nelson Gallery ascribed to Xu Daoning, Toward the end, we similarly are shown fishermen on the river and also travelers on paths and at the shore. Uh, these motifs were part of what made up for the artists and their patrons and viewers the concept of a landscape painting as a complete world, a microcosm, embodying their organic conception of an ideal balance and harmony of man and nature. Next. A detail of the upper right corner shows where something may be a written title of some kind has been rubbed out, or so it appears. I won't be able to answer questions about these aspects of the painting until I can see the original, which should be soon. Next. Continuing to look at the proper opening of the painting, the section at right with the distant shore, another pairing of groves of leafy trees, one set diagonally further back and lighter in tone, create the space within which, this time, a village is set, Low buildings seen as roofs above a wall. A gate leads into it, its thickness shown with double line drawing. It's quiet, the time must be early morning, maybe. As we move leftward across the open fields, we pass two boys with water buffalo, drawn small but distinguishable. And then uh, they, they are taking their buffalo out the, to pasture, that is. And then we see two men on a bridge. Then another grove of leafy trees, sensitively drawn in silhouette, and answered once again by another, smaller and dimmer, further back and to the left. We begin to appreciate the spatial richness of this painting, which may escape us on a quick viewing. And then as we move still further leftward and back, another village, another cluster of low roofs set against fog and more trees. So here in a single composition, representing an idyllic rural scene inhabited by wood gatherers and fishermen and farmers. We are presented also with two quiet villages, near enough to each other that their denizens can visit each other for market days or other communal occasions. A classically educated Chinese might well be reminded of one of the ancient Book of Odes verses, verses that tells of two villages so close together that the inhabitants of one can hear the barking of dogs and the crowing of cocks in the other. And once again, we have to pause to recognize how this deceptively simple, quiet painting turns out to be so rich in illusions, both pictorial and literary, which would be appreciated and enjoyed by the cultivated Chinese viewer. Next. And here, to wind up this lecture, except for whatever additions I make after seeing the original painting, is a combined image showing the whole painting. This is the work that was cataloged <laughs> as 18th, 19th century, 
by the auction gallery. One can excuse them since it was under glass and hard to see, and it was valued at a few hundred euros. It will end up, no doubt, in our Berkeley Art Museum, a gift for me, and in time will be exhibited there. And that winds up all that I mean to say about the painting before I have a chance to see it in the original, when I will, end, I will add an ending to this lecture.